This is Dr. Roger Green in his teaching on American Christianity. This is session number four, Denominationalism in the American Colonies. This is Roger Williams of Religious Diversity in Rhode Island. So we've kind of reminded ourselves about how important Roger Williams was and how important Rhode Island was. And then the the rise of the Quakers, uh, we talked about the rise of the Quakers, George Fox, the rise of the Quakers, and then we got the Quakers over here to America. So uh, they are obviously a very important group um, and uh, settling mainly in Rhode Island, although not exclusively. So that's kind of where we left off. We didn't uh, get to the Baptist yet. Hello, Chris. Oh, we're taping this, so I better just keep going. Uh, so we didn't get to the Baptists yet, so let's go to the Baptists, and then, um, and then we'll move on to Lecture 3. So, Baptist denominations in Rhode Island, and then G, the continued history of the Baptists. So there are basically, in Rhode Island, uh, these are basically English Welch Baptists now, and there are basically, in Rhode Island, there are uh, two kinds of Baptists. Obviously, Calvinist Baptists, and... Um, and uh, after John Calvin, on the right-hand side, those are the dates of John Calvin. Yeah, we're on F, uh, Baptist denominations in Rhode Island. And then we'll just see G is very quick, just kind of continued history of the Baptists. But. So, um, there were two kinds of Baptists in Rhode Island. And uh, first, the Calvinist Baptists. And there's a picture of John Calvin on the right-hand side. But there were some people um, who didn't agree with the Calvinist Baptists, and they took on the label Arminian Baptists, named after Jacob Arminius. And here's a picture on the left-hand side of Jacob Arminius, and those are the dates of Arminius. Now, there's not a lot that separated Arminius from Calvin. Arminius was asked, in a sense, to kind of defend the Calvinist, uh, Calvinist theology, and there were some things he could defend and others that he couldn't. But for our, for our purposes, the one place that seemed to be appealing to a lot of pap- Baptists in terms of theology was in the area of free will. And so they look at Arminius as kind of their proponent of freedom of the will to say yes or no to God. Whereas, of course, the Calvinist Baptists were predestinarian folks who believed that some people are predestined to be saved, and other people are predestined or elected to be lost. So the Arminian Baptists come along, and there is this split in Rhode Island over the Calvinist Baptists and the Arminian Baptists. So, now let's talk about the uh, this kind of theological controversy. You can guess what side Roger Williams is going to take. Remember, we said Roger Williams was a Baptist, but for a very brief time, and he actually helped to build the first. Baptist Church in America, um, you can guess what side he's going to take. Because Roger Williams is all about freedom, isn't he? In terms of his political, uh, political lo- life and what he set up in Rhode Island, absolute religious freedom. That's what he's all about in a political kind of civil life. Well, you know that he's going to be an Arminian Baptist when he becomes a Baptist because the Baptists emphasize freedom of the will. So sometimes there's this con, con, uh, coming together of a belief in, in political freedom, civic freedom, and freedom of the will in terms of religious life as well. And Roger Williams will, come, uh, will do that. Um, uh, so it's not a surprise that he would join the Arminian Baptists to emphasize this freedom. Now, there is another name for the Arminian Baptists. They took on a name called the Six Principal Baptists. The Six Principal Baptists. And the six principal Baptists um, um, uh, took on Hebrews 6, 1 and 2. So Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 was their kind of denominational, kind of explained their denominational doctrines. And there are six principles in Hebrews 6, 1 and 2 that I'll mention here. Uh, I have actually met people who belong to the Sixth Principal Baptist Church, because as we will see, um, a a denomination formed by that name out of the Arminian Baptists 
And there's a lot of Baptist denominations around today. You'd be surprised. We'll show that another time we show some of those Baptist denominations in America. Um, and there's a lot around. Some of you may be Baptists, um, but it'd be interesting to know kind of at the end of the course what your Baptist affiliation is. Um, there's a lot of ba- Baptist denominations. Okay, here are the six principles. As far as they were concerned, these are the six basic principles of Christianity. This really explains Christianity from Hebrews. Number one, repentance. Principle number one, repentance. Very important, obviously. Principle number two, of course, is faith. Principle number three uh, that you would not be surprised about, of course, is baptism. Third principle, very important. Principle number four is the laying on of hands. And the laying on of hands signifies the reception of the Holy Spirit from one generation to another generation. So it is also, the laying on of hands also became the way in which ordination was carried out. The congregation laying on of hands to ordain someone to the pastoral ministry. So number four, laying on of hands. Number five, the resurrection of the dead. And number six, eternal judgment. So, as far as they're concerned, looking at this Hebrews passage, those are the six principles of the um, of the Christian faith, and they're going to be our principles. And so, we're not only going to call ourselves Arminian Baptists; we're going to call ourselves Six Principle Baptists. So, what happens is now let's go to number G, the continued history of the Baptists, and let's say a a few things about the continued history of the Baptists. Um, The Baptists. were a very small group in the 17th century. They didn't start to pick up steam until the 18th century. And so let me just mention a couple of examples of kind of Baptist formations in the 18th century. The first is a university that they founded. They founded the university in 1764, and it was called Brown University. Brown University was founded, it wasn't actually founded in Providence. Uh, it was founded in a, in a town called Warren, Rhode Island. I forget, I need to look at the cards to see if some of you are Rhode Islanders here. But it was founded in a town called Warren, Rhode Island. It moved to Providence uh, 10 years later or so. And it was called Brown University. Very interesting. Founded uh, by the Baptists to train Baptist preachers. And also founded because it was believed by the founders that uh, the Baptists in Rhode Island had become liberal and weren't really maintaining their biblical stance and weren't maintaining, this was a Calvinist movement, basically, founding of Brown, and weren't really uh, retaining the good Calvinist doctrines and so forth. So the founding of Brown University was to kind of bring Baptists of Rhode Island back into where they should be in terms of the Bible and theology. So very interesting. Now, you fast forward to Brown University today, as one of the Ivy League schools, uh, you could ask a lot of people on that campus, why were you founded? You know, I'm sure many of them would have no idea that they were founded by Baptists, for Baptists, and specifically for Baptist preachers. So Brown is kind of a good example of uh, that continued history in terms of trying to maintain those emphases that we've mentioned. Another thing we should just mention, and that is there were some other Baptist denominations founded uh, in this area pretty quickly here. I'm going to just mention two, but as I say later in the course, we'll mention others. One group was called the Particular Baptists. That's the label that got kind of attached to them. The Particular Baptists, uh, because they believed only in believer's baptism, of course, which meant adult baptism, and they felt that some Baptists were kind of slipping in this doctrine. And so they reaffirmed the doctrine of, of adult baptism, believer's baptism, uh, which, of course, is the thing that uh, kind of signifies the Baptist movement in general. But they got the label particular Baptists, and uh, one of, label of one of many. So the second group I just want to mention, and I, only, I mention this group because we come across a similar group a couple hundred years later, and that is the, probably you've never heard of this denomination, but it's the Seventh-day Baptists. The Seventh-day Baptists. Now, they were founded in 1666, 
um, because they believed that uh, Christians were living up to nine commandments, but not to the tenth commandment, to the remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And so they, they worshipped, uh, and still do, on uh, Friday night and Saturday. The Seventh-day Baptist. Very interesting. Now, I mention them because in the, in the, um, later in the 19th century, we come upon Adventist groups. And the largest of the Adventist group that we're going to see much later on in this course, but the largest of the Adventist group are going to be the Seventh-day Adventists. So the Seventh-day Adventists are going to come along and they're going to come along with the same doctrine of remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. So, but anyways, a couple Baptist denominations will want to watch for the Baptist denominations as they, as they move along and increase and so forth. But those are two names, the particular Baptists and the uh, Seventh-day Baptists. So, Roger Williams and Religious Diversity in Rhode Island. So, let me stop there for just a minute. Anything about this lecture here? We're looking basically at uh, Roger Williams, and then we looked at the Quakers, and then quickly looked at the Baptists and see what's happening in Rhode Island. Okay, yeah. Uh, the University, it was where originally? It was in a place called Warren, Rhode Island. W-A-R-R-E-N. Small town uh, near Providence. Uh, there's still a church there, um, and uh, kind of commemorating the founding of Brown University in that small town. Then it moved to Providence, which was much more the kind of the center of life in Rhode Island at that time. Uh, Aaron? Um, so the only thing that, that was the basic, that, that actually it was that belief that caused the division between the two groups. The first group that was founded in Rhode Island were these Calvinist Baptists. And, um, and some of the people within that movement, however, um, didn't believe in predestination or election. So they move out, call themselves Arminian Baptists, and then some of them start to call themselves Six Principal Baptists, um, but still with an Arminian belief in free will and so forth. So that, yeah, yeah. Yes, this is all happening in Rhode Island, which is the place of absolutely religious freedom, absolutely religious liberty. And so the Puritans, um, yes, they they... They didn't like the Baptists, I'm sorry to say. I'm sorry for you Baptists out there, but uh, they didn't like the Quakers either. But you can't get your hands on them in Rhode Island, I mean, because this is a bastion of religious liberty. So the Puritans were offended by, um, by, by the Baptists in general, as they were by the Quakers. Yeah. Yeah. Something else here before we leave these folks. Okay, let's go to three, lecture three, where we're... We're, we are supposed to be this week, Lecture 3, Denominationalism in the American Colonies. And so what we're going to do here, we're going to do, we're going to do two, two things. New, we're going to look at various places, as you can see, and various leaders, um, and find out how these denominations got kind of settled in to the, Ameri in the American colonial period. And by the time we get to the American colonial period. Then we're going to draw some conclusions, and in the conclusions we're going to look back kind of geographically. So, first of all, we're going to see about denominationalism in the American colonies. Okay, for, we're going to start with New England here. Um, and you will know what, um, uh, you already know what the, uh, what the denominational in makeup of New England was. Denominational makeup is mainly congregational. Congre remember, the Puritans and the Pilgrims kind of came together and formed congregationalism. Congregationalism became the dominant um, religious tradition in New England. And so every little town you go to, you, you might see a white steepled congregational church. Um, now, some of those congregational churches became Unitarian. Now, that's, that's another story for another time. Uh, but the churches are still there, and they might be Unitarian churches, not congregational churches. But there's no doubt that in New England um, that was the case. Now, other groups then uh, in New England finally took foothold, and so we mentioned already the Quakers, and we mentioned already the Baptists. There is one more group we want to mention that took uh, kind of for New England um, – uh, was it, was it, were able to come in and kind of stay for a while, and those were the Anglicans. So the Anglican Church comes in 
uh, to New England, and there are Anglican churches, of course, in Rhode Island, but eventually, even in Boston, there are Anglican churches. Uh, you pass by a lot of them in Boston. We'll talk about some of the more famous ones. So, so that's obviously New England, and that's what we've been studying. So, Okay, let's go down. Um, let's, uh, oh, let's mention B. Let's mention just mention Rhode Island, of course. We know in Rhode Island, because of that religious liberty, that included anybody and everybody uh, who wanted to come. But it was predominantly Quaker, Congregational, and eventually, and, and Baptist, and then eventually Anglicans settled into Rhode Island as well. So, um, so for New England, it's pre- predominantly congregational, but then Baptist, Quaker, Anglican. Okay, now we come to New York, because we haven't, we've talked about New England enough in the previous lecture, so now we need to talk about New York. So, Okay, first name of New York, of course, was New Netherlands. The New Netherlands. Um, New York was founded originally as a Dutch colony. And, of course, it was founded as a Dutch uh, trading colony, predominantly. All right, so there is this place called New York. Um, Now, what happens is, of course, the people who come to this Dutch trading colony from Holland, they are from a denomination church group called the Dutch Reformed. So they obviously are Reformed, they're mainly Calvinist in their kind of theological orientation, but because they come from Holland, they get this label kind of Dutch Reformed. Now, the Dutch Reformed folks have a pretty high view of ordination, pretty high view of who should be the minister and so forth. So when they come here originally to settle in these Dutch Reformed people who are coming here basically as traders, when they come to settle in, they don't have any ordained preachers. They don't have any ordained ministers. The lay people can do some things, like visit the sick. They can read sermons and so forth, but they are limited in terms of what they can do. And so the Dutch Reformed Church, in a sense, uh, was just kind of, in a sense, run by the lay people until the first minister came. And wouldn't you know, the first minister set sail from Amsterdam on January 24th of 16, what is it, 16, uh, 1628, yesterday. Yesterday was the, um, the anniversary of the date of the setting sail of the first Dutch Reformed ordained minister. And coming here to kind of, um, to kind of uh, found the first Dutch Reformed church and be a minister in that church. So uh, January 24th, 1638, he sails from Holland. It's about a 10-week journey in those days. And he comes here with his wife and family, and the Dutch Reformed Church is now planted um, in uh, this place called the New Netherlands. So there's another denomination, one we haven't seen. Um, so we haven't talked about these people yet. So here, here, here it comes here. So, Okay, now along came maybe one of the most famous people, not only in American church history or Christian history, but more also in kind of political history, Peter Stuyvesant. Peter Stuyvesant was the governor of, um, of, the, of the New Netherlands uh, from, until 1664. So he, he became governor in 1647 and was the governor until 1664. Now, Peter Stuyvesant obviously was Dutch Reformed. And Peter Stuyvesant wanted to make the Dutch Reformed Church the church of the New Netherlands. That is, if you were going to be a voting member uh, male, of course, women didn't have the votes yet. So if you're going to be a voting member of this community, you had to be Dutch Reformed. He wanted to kind of impose that upon, upon uh, the, the, uh, the people. Um, and he also had um, the kind of the same kind of Puritan dislike of these dissenting groups because there were some Quakers in the New Netherlands. And he really did not like the Quakers. And there was a really a lot of oppression against these little, this little Quaker colony in the New Netherlands. So he kept a pretty tight hold on things uh, through the Dutch Reformed Church. Okay? Until the year 1664. That's an important date, uh, not only um, in American church history, but it's an important date politically, too. 1664, the English took over this community. And they renamed it, of course. They renamed it New York after York, England, one of the great 
you know, places in, in England. So they named it from New Netherlands to New York. Now, when they named it New York, they also brought in um, kind of a growing toleration uh, and a growing understanding of religious liberty that had been developing uh, in, in other colonies. So in 1664, it opens the door for other groups to come in to this place that had been called New Netherlands and had been kind of controlled by the Dutch Reformed, especially to Anglicans, because this is now an Anglican community. I mean, it's a British community, and especially Anglicans were quite welcome to come in. But a lot of other um, groups started coming into this place called New York. The Quakers felt pretty comfortable here. Also, a very small contingent of Roman Catholics came over into New York. Um, so New York is beginning to be a place of a bit of freedom and uh, a bit of toleration as well. So New York. Now let's go to D, and uh, let's go to William Penn and to Pennsylvania. William Penn and Pennsylvania. Okay. All right. Um, first of all, let me just mention William Penn. And uh, again, you might have heard about him in other courses, so I'll do this pretty briefly. Those are the dates of William Penn, 1644, 1718. William Penn, long story short, I'm William Penn, he was British, and he was British kind of aristocracy. I mean, he came from a very, came from the gentry class, from a wealthy class, from a landowning class uh, uh, family in, in, uh, in England. So he came from money and wealth and power and influence and so forth, um, and part of the Anglican church, the Anglican community. William Penn is a very interesting person because he's one of the persons who received convincement, as it was called, from the Quakers. William Penn was started to be taken by the simplicity of the Quaker message, uh, the simplicity of the Quaker life, uh, kind of following after Christ in this very kind of simple way. And so um, William, uh, William Penn eventually becomes a Quaker in 1666. Very important. And we've said this about the Quakers before, so remember, one of the, it's interesting that the Quakers had appeal to all classes of people. So there was something in this, in this Quaker religion that appealed to this very wealthy, privileged person. But remember, it also appealed to people in the servant classes as well and everything in the middle. So, um, so that uh, Quakerism really uh, went across, across the board. Okay, what happens is, it's very interesting, but what happens is in 1681, um, William Penn gets a charter from the King of England. Of course, he would have known the King of England, so forth. he gets a charter from the King of England, and the charter is a land charter. Now, uh, England is kind of dominating things over here in certain parts of the country, certain parts of this land, and so, uh, the, the, um, uh, so the King of England gives... William Penn, a little bit of land. Today we call it Pennsylvania. Uh, so the state of Pennsylvania. That's a pretty good, that seems like a pretty good deal to me. If you're going to give somebody some land, give them land the size of the state of Pennsylvania. And of course it was named after William Penn, Penn's Woods, Pennsylvania, Penn's Woods. It was named after Penn, Penn, Penn and his family. And, um, and then uh, he founded a city in the very next year. And the city is going to be called Philadelphia, the city of what? Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. Right, Philadelphia. So um, are there some folks in Philadelphia here? I, get, I need to look at the cards somewhat near Philadelphia. I like Philadelphia. Um, and I, I, we'll actually talk about this in just a minute. But So he, he gets this land, Penn's, Penn's Woods, and then he founds this city, the city of brotherly love. Sounds very Quaker, doesn't it? The city of brotherly love. Let's all love one another, um, so forth. So it sounds very Quaker. So, And, of course, what he is going to do as he establishes this, so now we'll move on to Pennsylvania itself. He's going to establish um, this place as a place of religious freedom. Uh, Rhode Island is, has been a model now a bit. Now he says, yes, I want this colony to be a place of religious freedom, religious liberty, because I'm a Quaker. And I know as a Quaker what it was to have, you know, to be under state oppression, uh, to be harassed. 
I know the history of Quakers being hanged in America, you know, in the colonies and so forth. Well, uh, we're not going to we're not going to do that in Pennsylvania. So religious toleration was absolutely important for the founding of Pennsylvania. So, okay, now, so he opens the door. Yeah, yeah. Right, he does have great resentment against the the, uh, the Quakers and against Puritans. Now, but this charter, this land charter, comes from Charles II, so we're into Charles II's kind of reign and rule by the time of this land charter. A uh, little more toleration here, a little more allowance for religious groups and so forth. So this, he gets this from Charles II. Yeah. Something else here? Okay, the doors are open. Open the doors, uh, Pennsylvania, and it's very interesting. The, one of the first groups of people to come in were German immigrants uh, because Europe was still uh, hassling with a lot of religious wars. And so a lot of German immigrants started to pour into Pennsylvania, which is very interesting, of all kinds of stripes. The largest group, of course, were German Lutherans. Uh, they are finding a real home in Pennsylvania. So this gets me to, so coming into Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, gets me to tell a little bit personal story here. Anyone from Philadelphia area. Um, the name, I, w- I went to high school and college in Philadelphia. So city of brotherly love, I know it well. And um, the name of uh, my high school was Germantown High School. I don't know if you ever heard of Germantown High School, but Germantown uh, a section of Philadelphia started to be called Germantown because of all the German immigrants who were coming in. So I went to Germantown High School. Um, so that's a very interesting kind of personal history here. So I can, I can really relate with what, is going, with, with what is going on here. Now, what's important here is that this is really another group. Uh, these, and there were a lot of different German denominations coming in. Lutheranism was the largest. One of my favorites were a German denomination called the Dunkers. Now, they're called Dunkers because they baptized, they really believed in baptism, you know, putting your right under. So there are a lot of German denominations. What is interesting here, however, is that a new kind of wing of the Reformation is starting to take hold in America because in the colonies. Because so far, what we've seen is the kind of the Calvinist influence, Reformation influence coming in to the colonies through the Puritans, um, certainly through many of the Baptists. Uh, we're seeing now a whole, different, a whole different atmosphere, a whole different group, a whole different Reformation thinking group uh, with these German immigrants, especially the Lutherans. Um, so they're not Calvinists. They are Lutherans, um, or they're from other German kind of denominations. So that is really important. Okay, now, because there was so much religious freedom, religious liberty, and because Philadelphia had been a really a well-established city, there were two groups that really found freedom to establish themselves denominationally, really to sink down their roots denominationally. So let me mention the two groups. First of all, there were Baptists. And there's a very important date for the Baptists in Philadelphia. It is 1707. 1707. Uh, What happens in 1707 is that this is the first formation of a Baptist association, 1707. And they feel they can do this in Philadelphia uh, because it's such an important city, obviously a growing important city when you think of the revolution. So it's such an important city, and also um, it's a city which allows religious freedom. Okay, now I, I should have put this. I should put this on PowerPoint, and I, I don't have a PowerPoint for this. Um, what is for Baptist? Those of you who are Baptists will know this. But uh, for the Baptists, what is the kind of the central place of authority for the Baptist Church? It's obviously not the Pope. It's obviously not some you know uh, Archbishop or some Bishop or Cardinal or something like that. What, what would you say is the place of authority for Baptist theology, for the Baptist church? In ter- who ordains? Who has the power to ordain in the Baptist church, um, Baptist community? 
the congregation. The congregation is the center of authority. Nobody can tell that congregation is sacrosanct. Nobody can tell that congregation what to do, even other Baptists. So therefore, uh, Bapt- you, the Baptists, I was going to say you Baptists, but the Baptists, and Gordon College was founded as a Baptist institution, so we know this from our own history, but the, the center of authority is the local congregation. So this becomes very autonomous. The local congregation becomes very important, very autonomous. Here's the center of authority. However, by 1707, you've got these Baptist groups Different, even different denominations, churches, and so forth, and they're all they're all autonomous. By 1707, the Baptists start to figure out, um, you know, it'd be good if we could form ourselves into a, if we could if we could have a uh, kind of a an association. Nobody's okay. Nobody's going to tell those Baptists what to do. Um, but those individual Baptist churches, I thought some Baptist was talking to me here, but <laughs> nobody's going to tell those Baptist churches what to do. But the Baptists started to figure out, boy, if we formed associations so we could support each other and discuss important things with each other, that's, that's really what, that's, that's going to help. It's, it's not that that association is going to make you do anything, you local Baptist church. So the first Baptist church, Church, uh, First Baptist Association in America was formed in Philadelphia, 1707. Now, we're, we'll see that as we talk more about Baptist history, but, um, but that, that is a very important date, and it's a very important event happening there. So, Okay, then the second group that, f- that found really Philadelphia to be important were a group of people starting to call themselves Presbyterians, Presbyterians. Some of you may come from Presbyterian background. And in 1706 in Philadelphia, the first Presbytery was founded. So if you are Presbyterian, you will know that the, the, the authority for the Presbyterian church is not only in the local congregation, but it is, it is an association of lay people and pastors who come together to discuss, um, you know, Presbyterian kind of issues. And uh, they would, these Presbyterians, 1706 Presbyterians, would be very Calvinist people. They would be people rooted in Calvinist theology. And so in 1706, the first Presbytery in America is formed in Philadelphia. So that, that is very important. Now, I'm going to just give a quotation here to kind of summarize this. Here's the quotation. Hence, no other colony... No other colony presented such a variety of religious bodies as Pennsylvania. So that's what Pennsylvania becomes known for. Pennsylvania becomes known for its variety. Pennsylvania becomes known for, we've got, we got a lot of groups here, and we've got the German Lutherans, and we've got all kinds of Baptists here, and we've got Presbyterians, and we've got Anglicans, and so forth. So, um, so that becomes kind of the hallmark, early 18th century hallmark of Pennsylvania. So, so William Penn and Pennsylvania. Let me just mention Lord Baltimore, and then I'm going to give you your break. Um, so we're at, let, let's go to E, Lord Baltimore and Maryland. So let's talk about Lord Baltimore before I give you the break here. All right. Here he is. George Calvert is his given name, and Lord Baltimore, Lord Baltimore is, his, is the name that he takes uh, when he becomes... Um, a, a privileged a person there. So, okay. Long story short, about George Calvert, um, he was also Anglican. George Calvert was Anglican, um, and um, and received his title uh, as an Anglican. But um, he started to be attracted to another group. Um, he started to be attracted to the Roman Catholics in England. No easy thing because the Roman Catholics also were persecuted. But uh, he started to be attracted to them, and like William Penn becoming Quaker, uh, Baltimore became Roman Catholic. So he took, uh, he took the Roman Catholic side, and um, now he received a charter earlier than William Penn did. He received a charter in um, 1632, um, just at the t- time of his, um, near the time of his death anyways. He received a charter, and he decided that he wanted to establish a place in the New World uh, for under, you know, 
under the aegis of religious toleration, religious liberty. And so that leads us to Maryland and the establishment of Maryland. Okay, um, first group of, the fr- oh, let me just say this, and I, I promise I'll give you your break. But the first shipload of people coming over to this colony they're going to name after Queen Mary, the first shipload comes in 1634, so after his death. Now, on that ship, there were a lot of Roman Catholics because this colony has been established as a place of religious freedom, a place of religious liberty. Roman Catholics would know that uh, they could go to the New World under that banner. The thing we want to take note of is that Roman, the Roman, there were a lot of Roman Catholics, but they were not the majority. So they didn't, there, there wasn't the majority of people on that ship. The majority of people on that ship were Anglicans. Um, so while there are a lot of Roman Catholics coming in to this new colony, um, the Anglicans still were a majority. So it's going to be, so Maryland is going to be a place where um, the Catholic Church is welcomed, Roman Catholics are welcomed in Maryland, but it is not going to be controlled by the Roman Catholics. It's going to be controlled by the Anglicans. Okay, take a quick five-second Monday kind of break. Um, Anybody need the attendance sheet while you're... Um, ...place called, um, what happens in this place called Maryland. All right, what happens is that through a man by the name of Thomas Bray... The Church of England, the Anglican Church, is established as the, what we might call the state church of Maryland. So the Church of England is established as not the Roman Catholic Church. Of course, they were, they were, they were a lot of them, but they weren't in a majority. So they are established by the, um, the, uh, the, the, um, the Anglican Church is the church that is the established church by law. So, all right, now... Um, Thomas Bray. What about this guy, Thomas Bray? Actually, this colony was under the aegis, under the control, as were other colonies, of the Bishop of London. So the Bishop of London was the person who oversaw Maryland and this portion of this new world. Now, but there's a long distance between uh, London and, uh, and the new world. And so somebody has to kind of be on site to kind of run this thing. And the person who was chosen for that was Thomas Bray. So he was appointed as by the Bishop of London as the overseer. The word that was used in those days was the commissary. So the commissary or the overseer of the colony of Maryland, uh, Thomas Bray, was the person in charge of that. Um, so, Okay, now... Um, Thomas Bray is best known for two societies that he founded. Um, So let me mention the two societies, uh, which are still functioning societies today, founded by the Anglican Church, founded by Thomas Bray. The first was a Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge, SPCK. So if you ever see uh, the initials SPCK in a textbook or anything, you'll know what this is, Society for the Promotion of Christian Knowledge. And for Thomas Bray, what this was important for um, was to build libraries in the New World so that people would have, not I mean, not massive libraries, what we think of it today, but have books available, build libraries in the New World. They could be connected to Anglican churches and so forth, but so that people would understand the Christian faith. So this was a way, this was kind of an educational enterprise. So he founded that, and that um, that, enter- that enterprise kind of forwarded not only Christian knowledge, but basically Anglican understanding of the Christian faith. Okay, the second group that he founded was a Society f- uh, for the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts, SPG, Society of the Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. Um, this is more of a missionary endeavor. So this is to support any missionary work among the, what we today call Native Americans, among, among people who are kind of heathens, who don't belong to any denomination. So the Society for the Pro- Propagation of the Gospel in Foreign Parts. So Thomas Bray is pretty important in kind of getting the Anglican Church established as the official church in this place called Maryland. Now, did that mean that Maryland was um, in- intolerant 
Uh, did it mean that it, it was um, unreceptive of other people coming in? And the answer to that is no. Uh, other groups felt comfortable. Now, you had to be Anglican to actually uh, vote or to be, um, to be elected and so forth. But did that mean other groups couldn't come in? The answer is no. Other groups felt comfortable in coming into Maryland. So it was, even though it was run by the Anglican Church, in a sense, it was, it was open. So. Okay, now we should mention Virginia. Okay, so that's the next on your list, Virginia, number F. All right, now Virginia. Uh, the date for Virginia, remember, is 1607, and the town that was founded was called Jamestown. Now, we talked about that in the very first lecture, so Virginia was founded 1607 as Jamestown, uh, uh, Jamestown, Virginia, after King James. Let me just go back for just a minute here. Um, and, um, but that colony, um, I don't know, it kind of disappears a bit. And all, all kinds of things happen in that colony. But um, never, that's kind of the beginning of it. However, um, by the time you get into the 1620s, 1630s, there are people in Virginia. Um, there are people there who are basically Anglican. Now, the, Virginia had a particular, particularly unique problem that didn't seem to be duplicated in any of the other colonies. Virginia was a massive piece of land granted, um, and the Anglicans who were coming over, you know, they were living in, it wasn't like New England where you had, you know, I don't know, you had Portland and Portsmouth and Ipswich and Salem and Boston and Providence. You had these these cities and towns that were almost connected to each other and so forth. Um, so it wasn't like New England where there, everybody was living kind of in close proximity to each other. Everybody was living scattered out totally in, in Virginia. So what, is, what are these Anglicans going to do in Virginia? The only thing they can do, because they really don't have priests to minister to these Anglicans, so they can't kind of establish the Anglican church and build churches and so forth. What they are going to do is they are going to run the Anglican communities with what they call lay vestries. So laymen, lay people, through what are called vestries, are going to kind of, uh, kind of assume control of these scattered out parishes. Okay, and they were very kind of extensive. Um, now, um, it became a problem. And the problem was, again, Virginia was like Maryland. It was under the control of the Bishop of London. But here's London over here, and here's Virginia over here, and there's a 10, 12, 15 week boat trip to get there, ship on ship, you know, and so forth. So what, what is, so what problem developed in Virginia that was unique in the colonial period or the early colonial period? These lay vestries started to kind of like the power that they had. They, they kind of liked that. And they started to really control the church as lay people, or control the parishes as lay people. Um, they started to hold a pretty tight control of these parishes. And that is not the Anglican way. Um, the Anglican way is a hierarchical way, Archbishop of Canterbury, and then you have your bishops, and then your priests, and then your lay people, and so forth. So it became very problematic. It looked like these people in Virginia were going to be out of control with these lay people kind of running the whole show in Virginia of the Anglican Church, and my, oh my, what are we going to do? So the Bishop of London sends over a man who becomes very important for American church history, and that's his name is James Blair. So James Blair comes over into Virginia, and um, he uh, arrives in 1685, 56, 66, 76, 86, 86, what, he's 29 years old when he arrives, 1685. Um, and he, um, he remains here uh, pretty much until, until his death. So uh, he, is, he becomes the person who uh, brings control to the Anglican Church uh, in Virginia. Uh, he brings, um, um, uh, he, he deals with these lay vestries. He brings priests over from England to start to work at these parishes and so forth. So he's the guy who was sent over to kind of 
kind of map out um, Angl- the Anglican Church in Virginia and how it should look and how it should be and so forth. So he kind of saved Virginia, in a sense, from becoming totally controlled by la- these lay vestries. Now, one thing that he did that I just want to mention because he's, he's known for this, and that he's, he founded a college in 1693. Uh, it was basically for Anglicans, but he founded the college in 1693. And I don't know if you have any of you been to Williamsburg, Virginia. Isn't it a beautiful place, Williamsburg, Virginia? If you ever get a chance, uh, it because it takes you back to the 18th century Virginia, you know, in colonial period. Well, the college was founded was called William and Mary uh, in uh, 1693. And it was founded, obviously, it, was, it wasn't founded to train Anglican priests, but it was founded by the Anglican Church. Now, the founding of these colleges, we mentioned Harvard, 1636. Uh, we mentioned Brown. Now, Brown happened to be a little bit later, but William and Mary was 1693. And you mentioned these colleges, and I think what happens, you picture these colleges today. So you picture Harvard University today, or William and Mary, you probably saw that college when you were there uh, today. Actually, for quite a few years, in William and Mary, there were no more than 20 students. In other words, there are more people in this room than there were students at William and Mary College um, in, for, the, for the first few years. Um, so they had like one building, and that was the place, and he was the teacher and so forth. So, so you shouldn't picture these places as, like we picture them today. But it was the beginning of really a great university um, in, there in Virginia. So, so Virginia. Okay, now. Let's come to G, the conclusions. I'm going to do two things with these conclusions. The first thing I want to do is I want, I want to look at the state of religious life in America by the beginning of the colonial period throughout the colonies. Then the second thing I want to do is I want to back up and take each denomination and just remind us where they were. I won't get to that second. I won't even get through the first thing today. So first of all, conclusions. What is the state of religious life leading up to the colonial period. What does religious life in America look like uh, leading up to that time? Okay, so a lot of things are, are happening here. Okay, the first thing that we are not surprised about is that by the time you get to the colonial period, there's, a, there's religious diversity throughout the colonies. So we're not surprised about that. We've seen all these religious groups coming in and kind of settling in and so forth. So there's a lot of religious diversity throughout the colonies. And there is, um, there's a lot of religious, um, a lot of religious bodies. There's um, kind of a multiplication of these bodies. So that's the first thing we see, religious diversity, different religious bodies, different religious denominations. Okay, so that's number one. All right. Number two is we want to take note of this because this is very important. There is no single dominant denomination in the colonial period. There is no single dominant denomination in the colonial period. Which means you're never going to have in the colonial period, in, in the colonies, you're never going to have what you had over in Europe where one denomination uh, is is dominant, and that becomes kind of the state religion. You're never going to have that, uh, not throughout the colonies. Now, you may have, you know, Massachusetts is, um, Massachusetts is uh, congregational, uh, Virginia is Anglican. I mean, you may have those kind of expressions, but you're not going to have one that is dominant throughout all the colonies. We are not going to be subject to what was happening um, in some places in Europe. So that's number two. So, Okay. Number three is um, all the churches that we've talked about here basically are transplanted churches. The denominations we've talked about primarily come over from Europe. They're transplanted over here in, into American uh, life. We have not yet really seen, as far as I can remember, but we have not yet really seen any denomination that actually began on American soil. So we're talking still about immigrant churches. We're still talking about transplanted churches, transplanted denominations here. So is there one that I'm missing here? The congregation was for transplants because they were Puritans and then they were pilgrims and then now they form congregationalism here, um, but they still were they still were kind of transplants in a sense. Yeah. 
So that is going to kind of determine American religious life. Uh, and then what we're going to see is new groups starting to form themselves on American soil, though. That, that becomes very important. Okay, now these groups that are transplanted over, congregationalism is a perfect example of it. These troops that are transplanted over, these groups that come over, they don't have the restraints that they had in Europe. So they, they find over here a, a real freedom, a real liberty that they didn't experience in their church life in Europe. And that becomes very freeing for these kind of immigrant denominations. So we should take note of that. So. Okay, another thing we should take note of is that um, a lot of these kind of established churches found when they got over here, they were okay for the first or second generation. There was a strength, there was kind of a sustenance, first, second generation. But a lot of these denominations that came over started to find themselves in decline. They started to find that they weren't keeping the membership in their churches or in their denominations, and they started to find that people weren't joining their churches. That becomes very problematic for these groups. And the question is, how do you deal with that? Now, there's a lot of reasons for that decline. Uh, of allegiance to the Anglican Church or allegiance to the Dutch Reformed Church or allegiance to the Congregational Church. A lot of reasons for that. Okay, we'll pick this up on Wednesday then. And, um, and someone remind me where we left off here. And on Wednesday, we'll, we'll start this again. Have a good day. This is Dr. Roger Green in his teaching on American Christianity. This is session number four, Denominationalism in the American Colonies.